We are joined by Jake Singer, co-founder and CTO of Swapstack, and Kelly Claus, a bubble developer and designer who was Swapstack's lead developer for a year and a half. They'll give us a behind the scenes look at the newsletter advertising marketplace they built and sold to Beehive. This session will be moderated by Andrew Vernon and Sam Morgan, who are both bubble developers on the team that builds bubble.io. Now I'll hand it over to Sam to take it from here. Thanks, Nicole. Uh, we are so excited to be here with both Jake and Kelly. Um, why don't we start off, uh, whoever wants to, can you guys tell me or tell us a little bit about Swapstack, what it is, why we're here, uh, kind of the, the high level overview of your story before we dive into the details. Absolutely. Thank you, Sam. Uh, thank you guys for having us. It's really great to be here. Uh, yeah, so Swapstack was a newsletter growth and monetization platform. Our mission was to enable newsletter writers, who we also called publishers, to build and scale their newsletter businesses. It all started from me and my co-founders' newsletters. We started writing and publishing and growing, and eventually we wanted to start monetizing it. At the time, this was uh, you know mid-2020 or so, uh, the options for monetizing new newsletters like ours weren't super robust, and so we set out to build something better. We started small. Over time, we built increasingly complex and beautiful features. Um, and so in this session, we thought we'd walk through some of the cool stuff that we built. Uh, really, we're just wanting to give everybody an idea of what's possible with Bubble. You really can build a beautiful, complex, robust platform uh, all on Bubble. We literally built a full advertising platform with all the tracking that you would need to support it. Um, but we don't have time to go through everything that we built on Swapstack. It was you know, a three-year journey or so, so it would be tough to do in a half hour. Uh, so we picked one major, or one specific feature launch uh, that we wanted to go through to give you a little insight into you know, what it takes to build and launch something kind of complicated. So with that, we'll start with an overview of Swapstack just to give everybody orientation on, you know, what Swapstack was, what the different capabilities were, and then we'll dive into the specific launch that we want to talk about. So Swapstack had a lot of features. Um, like I said, it was, you know, an advertising platform. And so uh, I think the easiest way to understand Swapstack uh, overall is to talk through the types of advertising opportunities that were available to advertisers on the platform. And, you know, this is not unique to us. This was kind of general advertising industry stuff. Um, but broadly speaking, we had three types of deals that advertisers had access to on the platform. There was uh, flat rate, cost per click, and cost per acquisition. And so we'll go through each of these right now quickly. <clears throat> flat rate is uh, essentially what it sounds like. It's, you know, a price is agreed upon ahead of time um, and is not contingent upon performance. So we had a few different ways for flat rate deals to happen on the platform, but our most robust was the, it was also the original core product of Swapstack, which was our one-to-one -one relationship marketplace. In this feature, advertisers could see a gallery of newsletters and then vice versa, newsletters could see a gallery of advertisers and see all their stats, their performance, et cetera, um, and you know, look for a good fit that they might wanna work with. And so, Either side could initiate a relationship where they would click on their profile and start, um, you know, making a pitch to them. Um, and eventually, if both parties agreed to work together, or at least to talk about working together, they could chat back and forth. Um, so we built a, a chat feature in here um, where they would negotiate the ad opportunity. If they agreed on a deal, that would lead to them creating a contract. And then after the publisher ran the ad, there would be, you know, an invoice and billing and sort of closing up shop for, for that deal. Um, and yeah, the advertiser would pay the invoice. We integrated through Stripe to do all of that. Um, and then from there, that was pretty much it. They could continue the relationship or, you know, and working together for future contracts, or they could go work with other publishers, um, and so on and so forth. So that was flat rate cost per click. Um, also pretty much what it sounds like advertisers and publishers and cost per click agreed to a rate for every click that was driven. Um, and so you might say, okay, well, we're going to work together. We're going to do an ad. And every time somebody clicks, we'll pay the advertiser, we'll pay the publisher, you know, in this example, $1.25. Um, and then it's on the platform to track all of that and make sure that everything, you know, was, was handled correctly. Um, and so of course, to execute this sort of deal, we, as the platform needed to develop a full click tracking system, um, with analytics and dashboards and all of that, uh, fun stuff. Um, and it was complicated, but totally doable on bubble or otherwise. Um, and it did unlock uh, a lot of options for us. So as you can see here, we added cost per click to that one-to-one -one relationships product. So it extended it from being just a flat rate tool to now being more flexible. 
Um, and we also created uh, what we called campaigns, which was a way for advertisers to come in, sponsor newsletters at scale, maybe pick 20, 30 newsletters at a cost. And cost per click was the easiest way to, to execute those. Uh, the last type of deal that we had on Swapstack was cost per acquisition. This is also known as affiliates. Um, the general idea here is that you, instead of getting paid you know, at a negotiated rate ahead of time or on a, or on a per click basis, this is uh, a per, per conversion basis. And so the general idea was a newsletter would promote a brand um, and send out an advertisement to their readers. And then the readers would have to you know, click on the ad and then eventually actually buy something from the advertiser. And then for each time that happened, uh, the advertiser would pay the newsletter some commission, whether that was percent or dollar, you know, ten dollar basis, something like that. Um, of course, in this case, we had to build a tracking system for that too, and so we needed different ways to track back conversions to like clicks or ads, uh, you know, from the original source. Um, the way that this feature worked was, as a publisher, we had this gallery of deals that were available, and it, this was a little bit more self-service. So publishers could come into Swapstack browse all the deals that were available um, and pick whichever one looked like it would be a good fit for their audience um, and essentially could run the deal whenever they wanted. So if they had a newsletter going out tomorrow, they might come in here, pick up a deal, include it in the newsletter. They didn't have to get approval or anything uh, from the advertiser specifically. And yeah, for every conversion that they drove, they would get some kind of commission back. All right. So that's an overview of Swapstack in general. Um, we have a little bit of a background. Now we can go into the, the feature launch that we wanted to cover. And so this feature was the final really big feature that we built on Swapstack before our acquisition. Um, so this was you know, about a year ago at this point when we were working on this. And it really represented a huge improvement for us in several key areas of the product. It was called newsletter affiliates. Um, it's in the cost per acquisition category. Um, and it was a way for newsletters to promote other newsletters. So in the affiliates example we just looked at, um, newsletters browsed deals offered by advertisers. Uh, generally speaking, we thought of advertisers as you know, brands or companies selling products. You know, maybe it's uh, like a protein powder or something like that. Um, but this was really newsletters trying to get other newsletters to promote them uh, so that they could drive readers to their, to their newsletter. Um, and so, it uh, didn't involve advertisers at all. Um, and in this context, a conversion was really somebody signing up for a newsletter. And so, um, yeah, basically, where did this come from? This was, uh, you know, we already had that affiliates product and, and we, you know, it was really interesting. It was working really well, um, but our users asked for it. Uh, I think that's, you know, something that definitely happened. We were talking to users. We, we heard from them directly that this is something they wanted, um, but, more interestingly, I think, is our users asked for it without explicitly asking us for it. When we looked at the the uh, behavior that was happening on that affiliates product that we just talked about, uh, what we noticed was that over, about half of the advertisers that had signed up to promote deals on our marketplace uh, actually were newsletters looking to promote in other newsletters. And that was a really interesting signal for us. Um, we considered that to be a little bit of like gaming the system or hacking the system. Not that there was anything you know shady about it, just more like it, the way that you would onboard to become an advertiser in that platform, it really was built and designed for product-based companies. Um, and it was not tailored for newsletters at all. And yet people were going through the pain of doing that to, to, to reach newsletters and to uh, run these kinds of ads. And so as we dug into that a little bit more, we realized there was a ton of demand for this. Like, news, like of all the sponsorships on our platform, some of the most effective ones were newsletter to newsletter advertising. And we realized that there were probably opportunities for us to uh, support this in a much more natural and native way instead of making our users hack the platform to get what they really wanted ultimately. All right, so that's a lot of talking about the feature. I think the easiest way to understand what was going on here is uh, a video that we prepared uh, demoing how it all worked. And then after we watch this video, Kelly will take it from there and go uh, a lot deeper on individual pieces of the build. Jake has been wanting to grow his newsletter subscriber list. So he decides to try out Swapstack's new paper subscriber feature. The first step is to connect his email service provider or ESP to Swapstack. He grabs his API key from his ESP, pastes it into the field and clicks connect. Once he's connected, he needs to set up his deal. He decides how much he wants to pay the publishers who run the deal for each subscription they drive and sets a total monthly budget. 
Then he describes the kind of reader he'd like to attract and sets some parameters to filter out publishers who probably aren't a good fit. The next step is to build his ad creative. This includes a logo, headline, some copy, and a call to action. Publishers will be able to copy this creative with a single click and paste it directly into their email, making it super easy for them to run the ad. In just a few minutes, his deal is fully set up. To get the ball rolling, Jake can invite publishers he thinks would be a fit to run the ad. He can browse through the full gallery of publishers or search for ones he knows from before. He searches for pre-money, which is written by his friend Kelly and invites her to run his deal. While he's waiting for Kelly to respond to the invitation, he sees that Swapstack has provided a pre-written social post that he can share, which links to a custom landing page built on Webflow. This bubble to Webflow integration allowed Swapstack to display a gallery of live newsletter affiliate deals on its marketing website, which updates in real time as new deals are added. The next day, Kelly logs into Swapstack to find an ad to place in her newsletter. She browses through the gallery of newsletter affiliate deals to see if any are a good fit. She sees there's an invitation from the flywheel and she knows her readers would appreciate Jake's content, so she decides to run it. She copies the suggested creative, pastes it into her email, and sends it out to her readers. Tanya, who's been subscribed to Kelly's newsletter for a long time, opens today's email, sees the ad for the flywheel, and clicks on it. This takes her to a branded subscribe page built on Bubble. She decides to sign up and enters her email address. Through some API magic, she's now subscribed to Jake's list, and Kelly has just earned $2.50. After subscribing, she's shown a few more newsletters that might be relevant to her interests. She subscribes to all of them. In his ESP dashboard, Jake is able to see the new subscriber and that they came through his Swapstack campaign. In his Swapstack dashboard, he can see the number of clicks and subscriptions as they come through in real time. Swapstack has automatically thrown out spammy subscriptions, so he won't have to pay for them. And Jake can manually reject any others he suspects might not be legitimate. If Jake isn't happy with the performance of the campaign, he can adjust its settings to try and draw more relevant publishers. At the end of the month, Swapstack generates a detailed invoice, which Jake can pay with a couple of clicks through a Stripe integration. The publishers who run newsletter affiliate deals can also see detailed reports for each of their placements and how much money they've earned overall. Awesome. Thanks so much, Jake, for taking us through the, the kind of overview. Before we dive into uh, the details with Kelly, I had a question just listening to you talk uh, in the first part there, you know, as Andrew and I both, even though we work for Bubble, we both are constantly building things in our spare time and trying to launch side projects. I think the dream for every major Bubble developer is is to have an app that is successful. Either you have a ton of users or you get acquired or something like that, right? And, you know, I'm just speaking personally, I have tons of side projects that have gone nowhere. And I think that a lot of... Uh, Bubble developers will kind of, you know, sympathize with that. And I'm curious, like, you know, you mentioned at the beginning of your talk that you kind of knew that, the, like, this was a problem that needed to be solved. And I'm curious, like, how did this idea, come to you? how did you identify the monetization of newsletters as a problem that needed to be solved? Were you running your own newsletter at the time? Were you a big fan of newsletters and you were subscribed to a bunch and realized that there were no ads in them? How did this kind of come to be? Yeah, this was 2020. And if you remember 2020, that was the year where basically everybody was starting newsletters, like the first year of COVID. Um, and so I was one of those people. And so it was from personal experience and really to, to scratch my own itch, I guess is what people say. Um, at that time, you know, Substack was blowing up. There was a lot of momentum on subscriptions as a way to monetize newsletters. And so that is, you know, you're selling access on a monthly or yearly basis to the content. And, uh, you know, for me, that was not something I wanted to consider because it was, it was sort of a side project for me. And to me, charging uh, to access the content felt like something like professional writers might do, but I wasn't one of those. Um, at the same time, my newsletter was growing and I thought there was some potential there. And um, there were some other notable newsletters who I knew either personally or just because they were active on Twitter. Um, that were selling ads in their newsletter and making tons of money. Uh, but I happened to know that they were doing that very like manually kind of one-off basis, like through their networks. And so that's kind of where the idea started. I realized I wanted to try selling ads in my newsletter, but didn't really have any leads or anything like that. And so I tried listing my newsletter on a bunch of the platforms that existed at the time. And I got rejected from all of them because yeah. those platforms were really built for like a previous era of email marketing where you needed to have millions of subscribers for your audience to be valuable. In this new era, it seemed to me that you could actually have a very valuable audience at like 5,000 or 10,000 uh, subscribers. 
And yeah. so that to me felt like a very clear gap, right? There's this new type of newsletter, the audience is super valuable, the platforms that exist uh, aren't built to handle them. And yeah, that, that's pretty much where I got a lot of conviction around this idea. Wow. Uh, yeah, awesome. Thanks for thanks for sharing that. Mm -hmm. um, Kelly, let's go ahead and dive into the details. I'm going to pass it over to you. Cool, cool. Um, so I'm going to talk through just our building process. Jake and I worked together for a couple of years and we got pretty good at shipping new features. Um, and we developed this sort of very almost rigid process that we followed. And I don't think we ever wrote it down. We just did it. Um, this is the first time I've actually written it down. Um, so I'm just going to talk through it. Maybe interesting for you guys. Uh, and feel free, Sam, Andrew, Jake, to interrupt me at any point. Um, so the first thing I want to point out on this is that um, you see building and bubble isn't until number eight. It's almost at the end, right? There's a ton of stuff that happens before we ever open bubble. Um, there's a, just a ton of planning that goes into uh, a feature like this. And that is partly because we had thousands of users on our app and um, you couldn't just dive in and build stuff. You would mess it up, right? So you really needed to be um, very intentional about planning, um, as, you know, so you didn't screw it up and, and mess up your users. Uh, all in all, this particular feature took about two months from, from A to Z. Um, yeah, it was, a, it was a big, long project. Um, so I'm just going to glide over these first two parts because they're not te technical, but I do want to um, stress that they're really, really important parts, like almost maybe the most critical parts of the whole process is to talk to your users, uh, which I think, you know, founders hear all the time and it's really easy to just skip that part. Um, but, it, you know, it's the only way to know what to build. Um, and I'll also say as developers, it would be really easy for us to not ever talk to users. We had two other team members at Swapstack and their job all day long was to talk to users about the product, about what they needed, about what they wanted. And it'd just be really easy for Jake and I to just, you know, be in our editors kind of building stuff. Um, but we also did user user calls, not as many as I think we probably should have, but um, you know, we, we talked to the users using the stuff that we built uh, to really understand it. Um, competitor research was also, you know, an important part of this because there were other, you know, people or companies that offered similar products to what we had. And, uh, you know, we didn't do the research to copy them or anything, but we did want to know what our users' alternatives were um, for, for all the reasons. Um, so that was definitely something that we, we did a bit of. Can I, I'm, I'm going to interject just for a second because I'm looking mm -hmm. at your your list. And I, I'm just thinking to myself, like, uh, personally, I, I generally start with number eight, I skip through <laughs> one through seven, every single time I sit down to build a project. And um, yeah, I'm just curious to hear, you know, because there's obviously a different like I have, none of my projects are successful. And I, I'm willing mm -hmm. to bet it's because I'm skipping over one through seven. Um, so I'm just curious, like what your take is on that, because my, like my guess is it helps um, sort of limit the overall build time and, and put you in a position where you really know exactly what to do and you can be really efficient with how you put things together. Mm -hmm. uh, but I'm curious, number one, like if you've ever tried to just dive in and build and how that was different, uh, or if you haven't, why you view like this one through seven as such an important part of, like it's, it's interesting to me that you consider more than half the build process is not building, right? And that, that was kind of striking to me. So I'm very curious what your take is on that. Yeah, Jake, do you wanna, I have thoughts, but. Yeah, sure, I can start. Um, I think a few things. First and probably foremost is, you know, you, one of the things I said in the intro was that this is one of the final features that we built. This is not how things began <laughs> at all. Um, and so I think that's really important to note, like the, the things that were, you know, the things we were sort of like trying to, or I guess the risks we were trying to mitigate at this phase of the product don't really exist when you're just starting out. Uh, a couple of specific things there are, um, you know, we, you know, you have a lot of users at this point, uh, we have a bigger team at this point. And so there's just more that can go wrong um, when you're building in those kind of circumstances versus at the very beginning when you maybe have no users or maybe it's just you building on your own. Um, and so, yeah, I think there's a huge difference there. Um, this is something that we got to over the course of working together for a while. And I think this was 
we figured out was sort of like the way to mitigate as many risks risks as we could. Um, but I think when you're starting out, yeah, I mean, we could talk about what the building process looked like in the earlier days when it was <laughs> me before Kelly decided to to join the team and actually help us make things look good. Um, but it would look very different from this. Yeah. Well, I also think there's um, an aspect of like our team had grown, right? When when you, Sam, are just building something that maybe you'll sell to people, you know how to talk about it, you know what it is, you mm -hmm. know the, you know all of that. So you're the one talking to the users. For us, there was four of us. And so we had to co communicate like crazy so that our marketing side of the, the team could talk about the product, right? They yeah. had to know what we were gonna build and we had to know what they knew. So part of this is communication. Like that's what most of this is, is Absolutely. actually communication. It's, it's funny yeah. you that. Actually, so I'm noticing that uh, Vicky in the chat asked, how many people did you have on the on the swap stack team? So four, four total at this point, mm -hmm. okay. Two yeah, it, 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 at, at certain points it was five, at certain points it was three, but yeah, generally the two of us were the, the most of the time were the only developers. And then there was like sales and marketing on the other kind of business side of the house. Um, I think that's another important point. Like I think in some of our earlier projects, um, we would do less of this structure, structured work. And then right. we would, you know, review it with the other folks on the team who maybe hadn't been involved up to that point. And, you know, of course it's the first time they're seeing it. And so they're, full of comments and feedback and changes and, you know, very good feedback. <laughs> but of course, at that point, we had already built it, right? And so that's extremely painful. I think probably you guys have definitely been there. Um, uh, you've already built it. And then some exec who's never seen it before is like, why did you do that? And they're totally right. And, you know, you can't really ship something in that circumstance. Like they are right. So a lot of this was to like get the feedback earlier in the process, right? And right. Um, at the point where it's a lot cheaper to change course. Yeah, I love that. One thing I'd be interested to ask is, it sounds like there's some sort of spectrum of no experience with any of this, just starting out building a bubble, experience with all of it, and the the hindsight and experience to know the value that these things bring. If you were to speak to a new user in particular, somebody who is just getting started building a bubble, and they're looking at this list and likely feeling a little bit overwhelmed by all of the things that appear here. If you had to, I don't know, narrow it down to, to maybe one of the highest value items that you'd recommend that they should start early, uh, flexing those muscles and, and getting in the routine, uh, what would you pick? What would you I, narrow it down to? I think I would do number four, I think is the, is the key one. Um, so, I will move us to number four. I'll hold. Yeah, okay. <laughs> okay, so quickly for, for technical research, um, this feature in particular was uh, really reliant on connecting with other services, right? So we were trying to connect to these email service providers, MailChimp and Substack and ConvertKit, all of these other, you know, these other companies, right? And so just like Sam was talking about in the last session, you know, they they that required that they had an API that we could, plug into, right? And pull data into bubble and push data into their system, et cetera. And so uh, Jake, who is the API guru on the team, I don't, <laughs> I like barely touch him. Um, he had to test all of these out. He had to go and research, do they have an API? How does it work? Read the documentation, do some test runs. Um, he spent quite a bit of time doing that and then, you know, deciding which ones we wanted to, to build out, um, which I'll touch on later. Um, so that was, this isn't always a, a, a step in the flow. Like we know what Bubble can do, right? But in this particular project, connecting to other services, we just really had to like stop and, and do that research. Yeah. So flow planning, flow planning. Um, this is one of my favorite parts. Uh, basically what you're doing when you're planning a flow is you're thinking, okay, what is the user going to experience? What do we want them? How do we want them to get into the feature? What do we want them to see, do? and then and then do and then see and so it's it's mapping out the experience of the user and for us it looked something like this every time we did this for every feature um this is actually pretty basic in terms of some of our flow charts are just like madness right so basically what you're looking at is each step is one of those columns right each so that would be a screen it, it can represent a screen right so users looking at a screen maybe it has a form on it they fill out the form they click a button 
So then what happens? Well, all those gray boxes are like backend stuff. We're creating something in the database. We're making a change to something else, whatever. Then those blue, little blue circular things is a navigation thing. That's going to send them somewhere. It's going to show them something else, right? So then the next step, what happens there? They fill out some other form. They click some button. All this stuff happens in the back end. So what this does is it, it makes a visual for what we understand that we're going to build. I do this even when I'm working on my own projects as almost like a checklist, right? To make sure that I've built everything. But for us on our team, we might have different ideas of what we're building, right? Just based on what we think the, the feature is going to be. So one of us would map this out, usually me because I just liked it. And then Jake and I would hop on a call and we would talk through every single step in this in detail, excruciating detail. These calls lasted for hours and they were like delicious. They were so fun. Um, I thought, I don't know how Jake feels about it, but I love those calls. Uh, and, and we would go through the entire flow. This would take like a couple of days at least. And you need space in there to kind of like let it kind of simmer. Right. So I think this is one of the most critical pieces of any build, even if even if no one's using your app yet, is just to understand what needs to be built. Right? Does that make sense, Sam? Yeah, definitely. I think it, it reminds me of like honestly like in, in projects, you often when you don't do this step, you often don't know what the full requirements are until you're kind of like halfway in, into the weeds, right? And so um, this seems to be like, it's honestly something I need to do more because uh, I get <laughs> into those. What happens is if you don't do this in advance, your time estimations are all off because uh -huh. I think it's gonna take X amount of time to do this feature, um, but then you actually dive in and you realize, oh, there are all these roadblocks that I hadn't considered before. And so it's actually going to take twice as long as I thought, mm -hmm. um, well, especially in a team setting that can really throw things off, uh, you know, if other people are depending on your work. So, yeah, that's really totally cool. right. Well, and this flow, what you're looking at is the ideal situation. It's linear, right? You're going from this step to this step to this step. What normally happens, what always happens is users have a choice. They can do this or this. Well, you need to, you know, you need to branch the flows. So this is the starting point. And then we would have, you know, much more complicated branching out of, you know, if they do this, where are they going to end up? How do we get them back to what we want them to be doing? So, right. yeah. Um, One other question about that. It seems like there's some intentionality with where this falls in the list. Uh, like it's after user research, but it's before looking at databases, design, or anything like that. <clears throat> Can you speak to that just a little bit? Yeah, sure. So so basically each column here is, is a page or a view, right? So I would take this, I refer to this document for the, in the entirety of the build, right? And it told me what I needed to design because, and that's the next step. I would take that document and have it on one screen and then I would go into Figma and I would mock up the design for each each step. So this, you know, thing you see in the top left is, you know, the, the place where they enter the app, right? The things on the bottom there, those are pop-ups for different, you know, actions that we need them to take. Um, so yeah, that flow planning dictated everything that came after it, right? Um, now we would do the design next. A lot of people do the design after database, but I, I don't like that. I, I like designing it first because then you can show it to, I can show this to Jake and go, is this what you're thinking? And I can show it to the rest of the team and go, this is what this is going to flow like, right? We would actually build out prototypes in here, clickable prototypes so that we could click through and show the rest of our team and users sometimes um, test out the experience to, to see if they understood it um, and if we were missing anything. And we would tweak this for days and days, you know, tweak the design, make, make different, you know, different pop-ups, put this over here instead of here, move that later on in the flow, whatever. And then once we had the experience fully fleshed out and visualized, so everybody understood it, everybody on our team understood what was supposed to happen. Only at that point did we go into database design because then you knew what you needed. You, you could look at those designs and go, ah, okay, we're asking them to create a contract. Well, we need a data type for a contracts, right? We're asking them, these are the input inputs on that form. We need fields on that data type for those inputs. 
right? It just dictated everything. Um, and so here's, <laughs> we used Lucid is the program that we used for this. Um, and we would map out every single data type, every single field. Uh, a lot of times they were all connected to each other. You know, um, it looks very complicated and overwhelming, but uh, this was another thing that like, I would take a crack at first and then Jake and I would have a number of calls to kind of hash out all the specific details. You can see like just paragraphs of notes in here. Um, yeah, this was another thing that I would reference constantly through the build. Very cool. Very, very cool. Um, I'd like to ask just that there's a bunch of questions in the chat and sure. uh, I'd love to ask just a couple of them just to kind of get people uh, some answers to some of the things that they're wondering. So um, one of the ones that came up, uh, and either one of you I think can take this, is Vicky's wondering, like, how long did it take you to get good at Bubble, right? Like, mm. did you have prior development experience, um, you know, when you first discovered Bubble, like, what was that process like for you? And how long until you felt like you could confidently approach an app and, and you know, build something that was, uh, you know, a real app, so to speak? Yeah, we have very different experiences. I think uh, mine was I, I found Bubble and I was like, ah, oh, this is perfect. And it was suited to my background. I was a designer, but I also was a database. <laughs> I built databases prior to that. And so it just like was a perfect fit for me. And I just fell in love with it immediately. And I was already freelancing. And so I just hit pause on all my clients and I just dove into Bubble. I probably bubbled 60 hours a week for like a month. And by the end of that month, I was pretty good at it. Um, but I still feel in hindsight, like I was a newbie. So you can do the math on that. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, Jake. Uh, but uh, sorry, I, I just now feel like I'm really good at bubble. And I've been <laughs> bubbling now for three years. So I, I don't know, it, it, it takes a lot of work. I'm not gonna sugarcoat it. It's a lot of work. Yeah, and I'll just quickly add, I know we have a lot more to cover still, but um, I I did have a bit of a coding background before, but it was totally self-taught. I had come out of a corporate career and wanted to kind of teach myself how to code just more out of interest. And so I spent a few, maybe six months or so learning uh, like React and various other things, uh, just sort of like using online courses and then eventually found Bubble somehow. and. I did feel that actually having that background in coding was super helpful um, just because some of the concepts are all basically the same. Well, so Jake, going off of that, with your background in traditional development, you stumble on Bubble. How did you make that decision for uh, Bubble to be the platform for Swapstack? Yeah, I actually first encountered Bubble maybe a year prior to that. I think right when the pandemic started, uh, my friend and I had an idea for you know some streaming something or other. And we, uh, I think we just, kind of randomly chose Bubble as something we sort of came across and thought it would be interesting to learn. And that was sort of my first exposure to it. Um, and then later in the year when we started working on Swapstack, um, yeah, I mean, the first version of Swapstack wasn't really on any product at all. It was really like a Slack community and just kind of talking to people and kind of brokering deals and using that as a way to validate that there was a real idea here. Um, but when it, came, when it came time to build the first version of the actual platform, um, my general feeling was the the condition that I had on starting a startup was that I wanted to build it. I didn't want to like have somebody else building it. Um, and so the decision was between me using my very, I would say like base beginner coding skills to build a full platform or using something like bubble, um, that, you know, I felt like was kind of like the right mix of everything where I had enough of the background to understand the concepts. Um, but I think bubble really simplifies a lot of the, like the language and the syntax and the things that like, you, you know, almost don't know what you don't know when you're starting in code, um, more, at least more so than in bubble. And so it was the sort of thing that we, you know, I hadn't had a ton of experience with bubble. I think we started off sort of as like, a, let's try this out and see, and like, we'll probably graduate from this and move on to other things. And then that just kind of never happened. Very cool. Um, we're starting to run a little short on time. So I want to kind of ask a couple of questions and, and sort of make the best use of the remaining time that we had. And one of the questions in the chat, I think kind of would lead right into what Kelly was probably about to start talking about in a second year with that number nine. But Robert's wondering, how did you grow your user base for Swapsite? Like how was, how did this actually um, take off and how did people actually start hearing about it and sign up? 
That's a Jake question. That's a Jake question. Yeah. Um, I mean, I'm sure you could talk about I it. I could too. talk about but yeah, it. In the early days, you know, sort of alluding to this, in the early days, just getting it off the ground, we were trying, you know, I think we were very focused on, you know, the classic startup advice of like doing things that don't scale. Uh, my co founder and I both had uh, networks that we brought to the table. And we were both doing um, different types of online communities. Again, this was 2020, everything had moved online. Um, and we were in, we actually met through On Deck, which was a, a like an entrepreneurship community. And so there were tons of startups in there that uh, were perfect kind of users for the, at least the advertiser side of the house. And so we just kind of like did kind of manual stuff to try to get in front of them. Um, and then on the newsletter side, basically the same thing. Um, I had joined a bunch of newsletter communities and so really just kind of followed the same sort of playbook. Um, and I think that got us off the ground to like the first couple, maybe hundred users or so. Um, and then from there, it was really just a long, slow uh, process of building different types of growth channels. Um, I think we invested a lot in SEO. Um, we did a lot on social. It was really a mix of everything. I wouldn't say there was like one dominant thing, um, but yeah, over you know three years, we eventually ended up with maybe eight or 9,000 users, not all of whom were active all the time, but a uh, pretty solid number. Very cool. Cool. Let's pass it back to Kelly. Let's, let's uh, curious to hear about build strategy through like the marketing and testing and post launch stuff. Yeah. Um, so I'll, I'll kind of fly through this part. Uh, we used a, a program called linear, uh, which is project management for software teams. And, and so we organized our project in there. We would sort of list out every single thing that needed to be done, assigned it to one or the other of us. And then we just like knocked them out, right? That was sort of like the, the strategy for staying organized. And that's because Jake and I were, it's a fully remote team, right? I was, we were on different continents actually most of the time we worked together. So we'd have, we didn't have calls all the time. We would have our conversations here in linear um, that we could refer back to. It was very easy to communicate um, in that way. Uh, one of the other strategies that we had that I think I would always forget about, um, Jake was very good at remembering this, uh, is to build out an admin dashboard for the rest of our team because they didn't work in Bubble and often they needed to manipulate data or you know do stuff for users and we did not want them, I mean, they just couldn't have gone into Bubble and done anything, right? So we had to build a special page for them. It's very ugly, uh, you can see. It doesn't look like the rest of our app, but it was just needed to be functional. So we always had to build that in, which would add a, you know, a day uh, to, build, to build that out. Um, and then of course we would build it. So uh, we would split up the work, right? And the way we decided that was, uh, we just have different skills. Jake is a backend guy, meaning uh, he, he does all, he's very good at APIs and you know, really complex technical stuff like that. Um, I just don't care at all about that stuff. I, I would rather not learn it. Um, and so I stick with front end stuff. I'm building in the editor what the users see and also the logic, what happens when they do stuff in the app, right? So that was sort of the cleanest way that we split it up. It didn't always work out that way, but um, generally that was how we did it. And I don't even know if we really talked about it that much. We just kind of assumed those roles. It was really convenient. Our skill sets were just pretty complimentary. Um, I don't know if we should talk about reusables or not, how important that yeah, is. Yeah, we have a little bit of time. Yeah, let's, okay. how, because this is one thing that I really wanted to hear about with this app is how did you guys make use of reusables? Um, what was kind of your strategy behind them? Mm -hmm. I know that you made heavy use of them. So I'm curious yeah. what the philosophy is on this. Basically everything is reusable. So we were, so there's, in Bubble, there's uh, this sort of like debate around single page apps versus multi-page apps, it's not a debate, but it's just two, way of do, two ways of doing it, right? And so ours was essentially a, a single page app. We had two types of users, so it was basically a two page app, right? So each type of user had one page and um, you can see here, this, this is uh, the stuff on the page, right? This is like all the stuff on the page and each of these black boxes represents a section of the page. And within each section, we had a reusable. And that reusable contained all of the content for that section. And so we would build that outside of the page in the reusable. We build out all the functionality, everything. And then we just take that reusable and plop it on the page. Now that sounds easier than it is because navigation is very tricky with reusables. Um, so we actually had a little fun trick, which was that we had a reusable for navigation. 
that we would fire from, and we just put that reusable in every reusable on every page, and we would trigger oh. customer flow. Yeah. Out of curiosity, is there any rhyme or reason to why, like I'm noticing that your reusables are nested within page level container. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was just for- Instead of putting the reusable at the parent level on the page mm -hmm. and having that group exist within the reusable? This is just my obsession with app organization and it needing to be very clean and to be Got able it. to see what things are. I'm just, it's my favorite thing in the world. And so it wasn't necessary, but it made it really easy to navigate our app. In fact, I have not worked a first swap stack in six months. And I was able to go in and find exactly what I needed for all of these screenshots, like That's immediately awesome. because of yeah. my brilliant naming convention. <laughs> yeah. The, the other thing here is that this is, again, the, the end state of the app, not the starting state of the app. And when I <laughs> built the first versions of the app, uh, it didn't look anything like this at all. No. Um, those groups, I didn't really use reusables. Um, you know, when you're working alone, it's the, the things you need to do are quite different than when you're working even with one other person. Um, right. And so these groups kind of were, you know, there already essentially. And I think it was probably easier to not mess with them and therefore all the things that would have to change, um, you know? So there's always that that element of like tech debt and trying to uh, iterate an app slowly over time, which, you know, make things eventually not always be perfect. Definitely. Yeah. Definitely. Maybe a quick follow on question with the reusables for somebody who isn't familiar with them or they're just getting started. Uh, what are some of the reasons you would choose a reusable for a single page app mm. instead of just building everything on the page? Yeah, you certainly could build everything on the page. Um, uh, for us, it made it easier to just, f I, I mean, there's a lot of reasons, but for me, it just made it easier to focus on the work on that feature when you have it like on its own sort of palette. Um, Jake, do you mm -hmm. have any thoughts on, on that? Yeah, I mean, I guess there's lots of different types of reusables. You can see this massive list of reusables that we had. Not all of these were major chunks of like the single page app. Like some of these were smaller things and actually were for the purpose of reusing them. Like many of these are actually used in multiple places. Um, and therefore, like that's a very clear reason to, to use reusables. Um, but for those big chunks, I think we moved in that direction. We, we again, I don't think we started there. Over time, we moved in that direction. Uh, I think in large part because like the editor seemed to perform better that way. And like these groups are all really, really large with lots of things, lots of logic. And um, if you could, you know, the, one of the downsides of a single page app is if you look at the workflows, it's, it just gets really big and really disorganized very quickly. Um, and so it was, I think, to more than anything else, like an organizational technique where we could keep things really neat and tidy uh, on the page that we're working on. Um, yeah, like this was a reusable and there's still a exactly. Local. So now imagine having 20 of these on one page. It's just hard to work with. Yeah, too Definitely. much. That's the biggest reason I would I would say too is just like general workflow organization and keeping yeah. things. It's a way of building, of using the organization principles of a multi-page app, but still keeping everything single page. Yeah. Um, we are unfortunately kind of wrapping up and, and out of time here. Um, can I turn it to you guys, like any last things that you wanted to chat about or uh, make sure that people got to know about this before we kind of uh, wrap up and end our session here today? You got anything, Jake? Uh, I mean, I think we talked about a lot of the things that we wanted to cover, I guess, uh, just kind of revisiting one of the questions from earlier. Like I can imagine that looking at this might seem a bit intimidating um, or yeah, I guess intimidating. Um, and yeah, I just really want to emphasize how much like this is not how it started. Um, this yeah. was a process over three years to, to approach or to arrive at this type of situation. Um, yeah, so I think the, um, the message overall is like, you don't have to start with this, all these processes and everything like this. Like, I think, you know, Kelly's answer was that four was the most important part of the build process from earlier. My answer would be that number one is definitely the most important part, like <laughs> talk to users, like five times more than you want to talk to users or at least that much. Um, and uh, things will probably work out pretty well. Well, and I think the through line to all of this is to write it down, like write down the stuff that you're building, make notes. <laughs> You'll need them later. I can't tell you how many times I've gone in a bubble and I'm like, why did I do that? And then of course there was a reason and then I'll just change it and it breaks everything. So writing stuff down in whatever form that looks like is, just for me is a critical piece. Awesome. 
Well, thank you both so much for joining us. This was an incredible conversation. Uh, I personally just had an awesome time hearing from you guys and, and uh, getting to chat with you. Uh,